master class this is the fifth edition of the serverless master class i'm shrivadya i'm a developer advocate at capless the agenda for today is along these lines we'll take a look at what the serverless master class is so in case this is your first serverless master class we want to help you understand what we'll cover in this series then we'll take a look at the objectives for the session we'll do a deep dive into serverless patterns and anti patterns and followed by a couple of announcements i guess so that's what we've got in uh scheduled for you today uh so hello world this is the serverless masterclass uh then should you join this event happens every month this happens on the wednesday so you will be receiving updates on the catalyst community and in our web pages as well uh what can you expect from the serverless masterclass Here we intend to provide best practices and trends that you can follow in application development in order to create better applications and design better solutions. So, what can you expect from this session? Ideally, a set of best practices and design principles that you can apply to your real-world projects that you might be working on. So that is the agenda for today's session. In today's session, we plan to cover patterns and anti-patterns for serverless. So by the end of the session we hope that you'll be able to think of these patterns in your daily job and you'll be able to utilize them when a use case comes up so uh next time you have a conversation you're able to say uh should this be a synchronous communication should it be asynchronous should you probably have a strangler fit pattern to decompose the microservice things like this so you will be able to see if you are able to use any of these patterns to your given use cases that said we'll be covering catalyst patterns as well as serverless patterns today so what are the learning objectives from this session we want you to understand the core concepts of serverless so we'll be covering this briefly uh because we cover this in every session we'll try to cover this briefly and we'll try to learn about the serverless patterns and anti patterns and discuss real world use cases of them so what is serverless serverless basically abstracts the need to manage a back end infrastructure so the provider like zoho will abstract this for you by taking care of that so we take care of provisioning patching and monitoring so all that you have to do is write your code and deploy it on a reliable infrastructure so if someone's really new to serverless i'd say compare this to uber so instead of booking a car for 10 hours you're able to book a car to where you need to head to so that way you're able to pay for use instead of paying for provisioning this is the exact difference between serverless and serverful paradigms where you're able to pay for what you use and consume instead of paying for provisioning so there are multiple types of patterns that are available the goal of the pattern is to simplify the development process because as we know the designing and architecting process needs to be stable in order to have a stable application so how do we bring in best practices how do we make sure that the applications that we build are efficient they give you low latency they basically help you deliver what you want so this is the reason we have a couple of serverless patterns again these patterns are general and we have catalyst specific pattern as well so serverless patterns are for applications in general whereas a pattern can be created for any application by combining a couple of tools that we have so for example if we have a couple of services you can orchestrate them in such a way to create a pattern so what are serverless patterns they are reusable templates that can be used for designing scalable applications on serverless infrastructure so again should we call it serverless infrastructure maybe maybe not but serverless platforms or serverless infrastructure the core goal is to give you a reusable template so next time you hear of a use case you'll be able to say i can use that template in order to do this sooner or i can use this template to do it more efficiently so that is the core goal with having templates like this acts as a blueprint to architect serverless solutions and it helps us share best practices about serverless design so this is the basics of what serverless patterns are so when we look at application pat 
sector we are trying to say what are the types of applications that can be built these are again classified as use cases in a couple of places application patterns in a couple of places but irrespective of the nomenclature this is to understand what is possible using the serverless pattern next is the communication pattern so let's say you have a couple of microservices so microservices are like smaller applications as gabriel mentioned you can have multiple microservices within an application they are independent components that can act together in order to perform a function so there are multiple types of microservices and we'll take a look at a couple of use cases of microservices as well but generally if you understand that microservices are smaller entities that work together in order to perform a core functionality then we've got you covered so um with that let's go ahead so we have multiple microservices in our architecture we want these microservices to communicate among each other for example let's take the example of an e-commerce system so we'll have order tracking we'll have shipping of course we should have inventory on the back end as well so each of this is a separate microservice Let's keep them aside. We have multiple separate microservices. These microservices need to communicate with each other, right? So if someone places an order, it needs to be processed in shipping. So how does this communication take place? Should it be synchronous? Should it be asynchronous? Should we have an API gateway? So that comes under communication patterns, which is the second type of pattern we'll explore today. Next, we're going to look at decomposition pattern. So Let's take the example of a monolith. Microservices and monoliths are kind of different from each other. This is because a monolith usually consists of multiple components that are tightly coupled with each other. So you'll have an inventory management system that is closely related to the shipping system. So there'll be uh it's basically a big ball and it's very difficult to unfurl it and see where every individual microservice plays a role. So this is the difference between a monolith and a microservice so let's say you have a monolith you understand that it's difficult for your team to work on a monolith you're diffi it's difficult to write code it's difficult to push it's difficult for observability as well so how do you debug the application that becomes difficult as well so you've decided that you want to go to a serverless microservice architecture how do you do that using decomposition patterns you'd have to decompose the application to the specific domains and then go ahead and build the microservices so the microservices might be available already but you would have to decompose and decouple them in order to create independent microservices finally we have distributed data management patterns so this is something we've covered in detail so we'll go ahead and get into each of these patterns let's start saga pattern and sanglific pattern so this is very common although these names look a little uh complex so let's go ahead and start with application patterns so we're going to go ahead with application patterns at a comfortable pace but we have multiple types of applications that can be built and we've covered this in detail in the home pages as well, uh in the catalyst web pages as well so firstly you can build serverless web apps so these are types of applications that can be built using catalyst uh Why are we sharing this with you? So the next time you're building a web application, it would be nice if you would if you could remember that it's possible in a serverless way as well. So we're just going to take a quick look at a couple of use cases where you can use the serverless approach. So serverless web apps for a to-do application of sorts, where you have a list of tasks that you want to do and you store this in the application, you fetch it again, and you're able to allow users to cross out all the completed tasks. So this can be done using backend services or uh, function services web client hosting. If you want to do file processing operations, so this is again a type of application. This can be a microservice as well where you have a mobile app that has that sends you request of images. So you take those images, you process them, you create thumbnails and you send it back. So this is a use case where you can use serverless you can use it for scheduled apps so if you have an operation that needs to happen regularly at a scheduled period of time then you can use serverless again so each of these are catalyst components so for example this is the cron catalyst cron that's available so we're scheduling it for every 7 days 
we've got the detailed documentation i'll make sure i share that link with you right after we complete application patterns so this is a short list of types of applications that can be built on catalyst so now let's go ahead and i want to know what kinds of applications you have built using catalyst so we need to share the link to the web page as well that has a couple of sample use cases we had built one of these systems in the past to pass the kind of tickets that we get to do sentiment analysis so whenever we get a ticket we try this out uh, for our support as well so when we get an e uh, email we try to pass that using a catalyst microservice we see if that is a positive negative or neutral comment and based on the sentiment we either create a ticket with it or we send the positive feedback to the team so this is an exact use case that we did this is an example of a microservice this is a back end microservice that we built it is an event driven application so we perform data processing this is similar to this which is file processing is an example mentioned here we did data processing so we took the data we processed it using this via sentiment analysis microservice and we took that data and we sent it to the respective destination so based on the result we would either send it out as a ticket so the respective team needs to look into it if there's an issue and if it's a positive comment we send it in to the marketing team for them to use it somewhere or get the testimonial or use it from there so this was something that we had experimented with communication patterns so when do you need a communication pattern when you need to communicate with microservices internally or when you need to uh, communicate with an ex external service that's when you need a communication pattern if services existed as silos if a service didn't have to communicate with another service then there might not be a need for a communication pattern but that's not, not the requirement that we see either from our customers or from our partners as we've discussed because systems need to be integrated and data silos need to be broken in this process so every application needs to communicate with other microservices internally and with other applications externally as well so how can we facilitate this communication this can be done in two ways either through synchronous communication or asynchronous communication let's take two processes we have process a and process b so process a sends a request to process b if process a waits for the response then it's called synchronous communication if process a requests for some information continues with the other operations and then receives the response then it's called a asynchronous communication so this is the difference between synchronous and asynchronous communication where in synchronous communication we wait until we get the response whereas in asynchronous communication we continue with the next process there are always cases where you should adopt each of them so for example i'm going to give you a custom use case where i would suggest a uh, a sequential pattern of sorts so we can look at this as sequential processing versus concurrent processing so synchronous communication is sequential processing whereas asynchronous communication is concurrent processing so so for example let's say you have uh let's take an event booking system for example and in that you don't want two people to book an event simultaneously so the event booking alone which is once someone starts booking the ticket can be synchronous again is that the only way not exactly but can it be synchronous yes it makes sense so you can probably try to create the booking part alone you can wait for the response before you confirm it to the user but in the meantime if you are able to perform some other operation let's say you are able to fetch user details from the cache or if you are able to perform an other operation in this wait time then it can be asynchronous communication nowadays asynchronous communication is popularly used across applications so this is because it reduces load time right why should you wait until the response is received before you continue with a completely different task so even in web pages when we usually make a request to a back end resource that is an ajax call that we make which is an asynchronous call that we make 
So as soon as the response is received, we display that on the web page. But in the meantime, the other processing happens as such. So if you keep breakpoints in your dot ajax call, you will be able to see that the request is sent and then the execution comes out of that. So we execute all other processes until the response is received. Once the response is received, we go back to the response and execute that. This, the reason we came up with asynchronous processing is to reduce the waiting time. And so this is the difference between synchronous and asynchronous processing. If you need a process to happen sequentially only, and if you're okay with the waiting times, then synchronous would work. But usually when we have to scale a system, asynchronous communication works much better. Hope the communication patterns part was clear. If you have any questions, you can ask me either in the chat or you can raise your hand. We're going to go ahead and delve into the next type of pattern. So we're going to look at API Gateway as a communication pattern. So API Gateway is like an intermediate layer that can work between your front end and your back end, and it adds a layer of security. So you can have throttling, routing, and other functionalities through the API Gateway. So this can act as a communication pattern wherein all requests to the server are served through the API Gateway. So you can have asynchronous communication coupled with API Gateway as one of the go-tos for your application. Again, it depends on your use case, but most of the times this should work. With that, I believe we've covered communication patterns. Uh, we're going to go ahead with decomposition patterns. So if you had to decompose a system, an existing system, how would you do that? So let's take the example of the e-commerce application again. So in the e-commerce application, we have multiple components, right? We have our order management system, we have our shipping system, inventory system, as Arjun mentioned. So how do we decouple all of them? We have to bound them based on the domain. So what is the domain or domain is a boundary within which you can define the service so for example uh, you can define clear domains and decompose the application what is another decomposition pattern probably something like strangler pattern might also make sense which is to say if you have a complete application look at the smallest independent component that can work so decouple that from the system and decompose it that way so this way if you keep decoupling the smallest component and putting it as a microservice You'll be able to see if it works for you. You'll be able to demonstrate a proof of concept and you'll be able to gradually move from a bulky monolith that provides you with a lot of uh, issues related to uh, code management, readability to a agile microservices model uh, using the strangler fit pattern. So what do I want you to take away from decomposition patterns? If you're moving from a monolith to a microservice model, then decomposition pattern will help. What are the types of decomposition patterns? There are multiple, but depending on your use case and depending on the domain, you'll be able to define it further. So I think we have the shared data patterns and anti patterns. After that, I'll share a document with you that contains a list of catalyst patterns. So these are sample use cases of catalyst components that can be architected in such a way to achieve a end goal. That can be sending an email, that can be scheduling a service, that can be storing some data. So these are just a couple of examples to help you think along these lines. Now, as I mentioned, let's take a look at shared data patterns. So let's say we have a couple of services like the order tracking service, customer support service, tracking service. Each of these can either operate with their independent database or they can have a common database. It's important to note that if each service has its own database, then uh, making sure that all changes in a single system is affected across all databases becomes a challenge. So consistency will become a challenge when you have multiple copies of the database. That's where the shared data pattern comes into picture where you have a shared database for logically grouped microservices or elements. So let's say we have an order processing serverless microservice. We group that together with the customer support microservice because both of these will operate on the user's data. So that data can be in a shared database that can be accessed by both services. 
there are a couple of things to keep in mind when using this because when you scale up a system that has multiple services sharing a database that can be bottlenecks but generally this is considered a good practice get to what are serverless anti patterns anti patterns are usually things that you avoid so these are like the big gotchas that we try to share in order to make sure you don't get into them so is there someone who would like to start off serverless anti patterns for me so i have three serverless anti patterns for me to share during this session which means your application will get executed or your function gets executed when we get a call what does this mean functions are ephemeral and stateless in nature so this is one of the questions that have been asked very frequently which is what if my function has to run forever there are a couple of ways of doing that by sending constant api calls we've got like a function warmer in place so what you can do is every x minutes before the function gets killed you can just make a dummy call to the function to make sure it's live but has anyone heard of cold starts is it a familiar term with cold start the thing to keep in mind is that your function will always need some cold start time so you should plan accordingly or you should not uh you should have a lambda warmer basically or a function warmer so let's stick with function warmer but you should have a function warmer in place in order to keep invoking the function before it gets killed but that's very popularly debated whether that is really required so if your function needs to run constantly then that's a discussion that we need to have to see why your function needs to run all the time so usually serverless is the best fit for event driven applications and scheduled applications if your function needs to run forever then you can create a cron or you can create a function or an application that calls your function regularly to make sure there's no cold start this is one example the other thing that you might encounter with serverless is with respect to again this is not a serverless anti pattern but this is an anti pattern i want to share this is something that we encountered recently which is if you ever push your code to a github repository please make sure you encrypt your private keys or your tokens this is something that we always advise and recommend so this is not a serverless specific anti pattern but this is an this is something you always keep in mind anytime you build an application please do not use your auth tokens or your credentials as such uh if possible store this in a secure place and retrieve it or encrypt it uh that's always the best practice and finally when it comes to serverless it helps to think of it as an event or a trigger so when we come from a server based environment then we always think of our application as always running but due to this basic difference of how serverless works so Uh, if you remember, as I mentioned before, the paper used the provisioning on demand aspect of serverless requires a significant shift in terms of thinking as well. So, how do we ship out the MVP quickest? The quickest is what you can think with serverless. So, one of the anti patterns for serverless is also uh, thinking in terms of serverful base, but we are here to help with that as well. So, the biggest take away in terms of an anti pattern is the cold start and the need to run the serverless application so serverless functions are usually ephemeral in nature meaning they don't live forever they are single use usually they are single purpose functions you can have multiple endpoints as well but as long as they help you serve a single purpose then it makes sense and there's always a cold start time that's involved with serverless functions so these can be a core takeaways for the anti pattern whenever you design an application please keep this in mind and if you see yourself asking how do i run this forever or if you see yourself asking is it possible for me to not have cold start or uh, is it possible for me to save state so one of the questions i used to get asked was how do i save state within a function so function doesn't store state but uh, your backend can actually store the state So these are just a couple of things that I wanted to share but I'm going to go ahead and share a couple of catalyst uh design diagrams with you so this is like a reference of sorts to say what is possible and how we would do it using catalyst Thanks a lot for joining us on the session today we hope that you were able to learn something and 
everyone who needs a uh, who gets a shout out please write to us at support at zoho catalyst with your handles we'll make sure we connect with you thanks a lot for your time everyone i hope you had a uh, i hope you learned something today and if you have any questions you can always write to us at support at zoho catalyst or leave a note to us in the catalyst community